joining us tonight. Um, my name is uh, Catherine Jones. I'm the pollinator officer at Bug Life. I've been with uh, Bug Life for about three years. I joined in 2007 and I joined Bug Life as a conservation officer for uh, the Urban Buzz Project in Leeds. So I've been working po with pollinators at Bug Life since I joined. Uh, before I was at Bug Life, I was working at the University of Leeds on the pollinator monitoring scheme project that's led by the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. You may have heard of that and I'll, I'll be speaking a bit more about that a bit later. So this evening I'm just going to talk to you briefly about some of the work that Bug Life does. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about plants and pollinators and people and the uh, connectedness between those things. So the relationship between plants and insects is essential for life on earth and we the people can have a great impact on the success of some of those processes. So Bug Life is the Invertebrate Conservation Trust and it's the only organisation in Europe that's devoted to the conservation of all invertebrates. So we're talking about bees to beetles, from jellyfish to jumping spiders, and from wood lice to worms. So in this picture, you can see a ladybird spider. This is a male ladybird spider. You can tell because he's actually got a, 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 red, a red tail. Um, Bug Life have been working with these on a Back from the Brink project in the southwest of England recently. And we're pleased to say that we've had some success. So Bug Life, our mission is to save the small things that run the planet. Sorry, our aim is to save the small things that run the planet. There are about 40,000 species of invertebrate in Britain. We'd like to save as many of those as possible. We'd like to stop the extinction of invertebrates and to achieve sustainable populations. So similar to the Love Links Plants project, rather than plants, we are looking at invertebrates. And in both cases, we've both got quite a lot of work to do. So this is a picture of the tansy beetle that you might be familiar with, which is closely associated with its preferred source, preferred food plant, the tansy. And these are found in the River Ouse in York and also in Cambridgeshire. So I wonder if you may also get them in Lincolnshire. We do, Catherine. Excellent. Thank you for that little chip in. So why are we so worried about the small things that run the planet? Well, basically because the small things that run the planet are so important. They perform so many ecological roles, provide a wide variety of services. So from biodiversity that Tammy spoke to with regards to plants, insects and invertebrates are important. For our food, the food for insects, the food for animals, insects are important. For pest and weed control, food for other animals, for nutrient cycling and detritivory, insects and invertebrates are really important. And that includes pollination. So this is what I'm going to focus on this evening. Insect populations, as I said, are in crisis. We want to protect them and prevent them from extinction. So some recent scientific work in Germany found that 75% of their flying insect biomass in nature reserves had reduced. So this is absolutely huge. So this isn't in towns, this isn't in agricultural land, this is actually in nature reserves. The reduction of insects substantially reduced. The other scientific research that you may have seen um, covered in the media in 2019 was the dramatic decline that may lead to the extinction of 40% of the world insect species over the next few decades. And if you compare this with other species, things like mammals and birds, the figures for those were less than 10%. Whilst those, those figures are appalling and we need to reverse them too, the extinction of 40% of the world's insect species is absolutely huge. So what are bug life doing about it? 
Bug life wants to reverse insect declines. We want no insect extinctions. Insect extinctions. And therefore we have a campaign, which is very, very difficult to say, although I just said it by mistake. So we have a no insect extinction campaign. And if you want to find more information about what we're doing on our no insect extinction campaign, you can look at that website uh, at the bottom there. But there are a few things you can do. On our website, we include five things that everybody can do to reverse insect declines. And they include quite simple things, which you as plant lovers and botanists and gardeners might know about. Things like use alternatives to peat. The destruction of peat is a real problem for plants and insects and other invertebrates. So put away the spray. Please don't use pesticides in your garden. It's, it's really not good for insects. Both the good ones and the bad ones die. Be less tidy in your gardens. Long grass and rough habitats, wood piles, habitats for insects can make a really big difference. And if you can reduce your carbon footprint by growing your own or shopping locally, that helps too. And if you're buying plants from garden centres, watch out for stowaways. You may find some non-invasive insects or invertebrate species in your plants. Things like flatworms, non-native flatworms that can have a real impact on our native worm populations. So one of the other projects that Bug Life has been working on that Tammy mentioned earlier are the bee lines. Insect superhighways. Bug Life have recently completed the map of the bee lines for the whole of the UK. The bee lines is a network of wildflower insect superhighways mapped and delivered through partnerships. So partners like the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust are delivering wildflower rich habitat to help the insects move about. This is a landscape scale solution to reverse the decline in insects. To identify opportunities for the creation and restoration of network of habitat, wildflower rich habitat. To reconnect our landscapes, enabling pollinators and other wildlife to move freely and supporting nature's recovery. And in this crisis that we're currently in, this biodiversity crisis, supporting nature's recovery is really key. Everyone can get involved to help create bee lines. The Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust are involved, many other partners are involved across the country, government organisations, businesses, city councils, all sorts of organisations, farmers, but everybody can help. Everybody can help to reconnect our fragmented landscape for pollinators and for people. And the Bug Life website at the bottom, the Bee Lines website, you'll find a fabulous animation that we've uh, recently done that shows exactly what we're doing and explains in simple terms how our Bee Lines project will reconnect the broken, fragmented habitat. So today I'm here to speak about plants and pollinators and people and the connections between them. So people can have positive impacts on plants and pollinators and people can have negative impacts on plants and pollinators. So in, the in the media recently, we, you may have seen quite a lot of reports of litter, in nature reserves, and I find it really distressing that people can go and visit beautiful spaces, look at the fabulous scenery, admire the wildflowers, see the wildlife, see the pollinators and other insects and leave their litter behind. I, I, it really distresses me. But there are positives as well. People can support wildlife. People can give donations to projects and wildlife trusts. They can volunteer and they can record. So in the bottom left hand corner is a picture of some people doing a fit count. This is a pollinator monitoring flower insect timed count. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those later. And in the bottom right hand corner, people are doing something positive. They're planting wildflowers to help pollinators and to 
increase the diversity of that environment. So let's start off with plants. Why are plants important? Through the Love Links Plants project, I'm sure many people have spoken about the many and varied ways in which plants help us. But the most important one is possibly they produce the oxygen we breathe. This is absolutely vital. They take up and store carbon. And many people think that that's, this refers to woodland, but that's not, the, not just the case. Other, other plants take up and store carbon. A diverse wildflower meadow stores a great deal of carbon. An arable field that's ploughed doesn't. So we need to create wildflower rich habitat, woodland, hedgerows, other diverse habitats that take up and store carbon. One of the most important things for us humans, plants provide food for us. So whether you're thinking about the apples that you mentioned that you have in Lincolnshire, pears, raspberries, strawberries, peas, beans, all of these are plants that provide food for humans. Then we have the wildflowers or perhaps the cabbages that provide food for herbivores. And also the pollinators, the flowers that produce nectar, pollen, and also foliage for our insects to eat. They also provide a beautiful and thriving natural environment that we all enjoy. So I looked on the Lynx Wildlife website, the Love Lynx Plants section, and I found that you had a, a certain list of wildflowers and trees that you had focused on, and you'd, collect, you'd collected samples for your herbarium. And I just wanted to highlight a few of those and how they are important for pollinators. So if we start off with the red clover, red clover is a member of the pea family, it has really long little flowers, and they're absolutely fabulous food for bumblebees with long tongues. The long tongues allow them to get into the flower and get the nectar. Field scabious, this is a completely different form of flower, a much more open flower that provides a lot of nectar and can often be uh, seen late in the season with lots of male bumblebees hanging around on a nectar bar. Field scabious is particularly important because there is actually a solitary bee that is associated with it, the large scabious mining bee. And it's important that field scabious is around late in the season, July, August time, when the, when the, when the, when the bee is on the wing, feed that particular bee. Common knapweed is another one that produces a really tight flower head that many, many bees use. Things like yarrow and the oxeye daisy have a completely different flower form. They're a much more open flower. Yarrow is almost like a platform that insects can land on. So this appeals to things like flies, including hoverflies, wasps, butterflies, and also to bees. And then if we think about the trees, the English oak, we think, why is that important to pollinators? It's wind pollinated. But the English oak provides so much shelter. It provides shelter while it's alive. It provides foliage for some insects to eat. It provides standing dead wood. They're notorious for dropping branches, or having dead branches on, actually on the tree. These are absolutely fabulous nesting sites for pollinators. And on the ground also they can provide fabulous nesting sites. And then the leaf litter on the woodland floor, that also provides a lot of habitat for insects and pollinators. So moving on to pollination and the plants in pollination, the Professor Jeff Ollerton has recently written a book called Pollinators and Pollination, Nature and Society. And the opening sentence is, it is easy to underestimate and impossible to exaggerate the importance of pollinators and the pollination services they provide to plants. And I think this really highlights the importance of the relationship between plants and pollinators. 
Our pollinators are really important to plants and they help them reproduce. And plants are really important to pollinators to provide food. So of the 1,500 native plants that we have in the UK, about 70% of them are, po are insect pollinated. The other 30% are probably see wind pollinated or possibly water pollinated. But to my knowledge, there's only one plant um, in the British flora that has a specific insect that pollinates it. And that's Lord and Ladies, also known as the cuckoo pint. That's where I come from in Kent, we call it the cuckoo pint. And this is pollinated by a, a midge. So what is pollination? So a pollinator is an animal that transfers pollen from one flower to another flower, hopefully of the same species, allowing them to reproduce. So the pollen is moved onto the insect. So the fluffy bumblebee lands on the plant, tries to get a drink of nectar and comes into contact with the pollen. Catches on its hairs and then it travels from one flower to another flower. And then the insect deposits the pollen on the stigma of the flower and this allows fertilization to take place. So why are pollinators important? Insect pollination is essential to maintain a healthy and thriving natural environment. And about 80% of our wild plants are pollinated by insects. The wildflower rich grassland is an important habitat for many insects including pollinators. A diverse sward, rich in flower diversity, will provide food and shelter to a wide range of pollinating species. Things like yellow rattle. The presence of yellow rattle is really important in a wildflower meadow or similar species. These are semi-parasitic plants. They can enhance the diversity of within the meadow or grassland by reducing the dominance of some of the grass species. What are the threats that we face with regards to wildflower rich grassland and meadows? The threats are primarily improvement. So when we add nutrients, we add fertilizers, if we use pesticides, these kind of things have a detrimental effect to our, our wildflower rich grassland. We would prefer to see semi-natural grassland that's unimproved. And also the timing of the cuts within grassland is very important. It's important for the plants because allowing the plants to set seed before they're cut is important for the flowers to, to produce seed and, and flower the following year. But there has been a move towards reducing hay cuts and moving towards silage, and the silage crop tends to be cut more often in the year. So let's visit a few of our pollinators. So we have quite a lot of pollinators in this country. So we consider a pollinator to be an insect that moves, is known to move pollen from one flower to another, or is likely to move pollen from one flower to another. And Stephen Falk, the entomologist, has estimated that there are 6,000 species of flower visitors that could transfer pollen. This includes about 250 species of beetle, 250 species of sawfly, 1,500 species of fly, including hoverflies, which are important pollinators, 270 species of bee, so that's solitary bees, the honey bee, and bumblebees, about 2,000 species of wasp, and about 1,500 species of butterfly and moth. So in this image, we can see quite a wide range of uh, pollinators. A lot of these are important pollinators, and I must admit I'm a little bit biased because I'm a, I, my, my expertise is bumblebees and bees. So in the, at the top, on the left-hand side, you've got a red-tailed bumblebee. 
Moving clockwise, you have a common car to be. Common drone fly, a thick legged hoverfly, thick legged flower beetle, a marmalade hoverfly, a long hoverfly, and the familiar honeybee. So, not only are some of these pollinators pollinators, but some of them are also natural pest control. The marmalade hoverfly is a fabulous predator of aphids. So if you have marmalade hoverfly in your garden, it will might control the aphids on your beans or your roses. So what do pollinators need? Pollinators need flowers that produce pollen and nectar. So the pollen is the protein part of their diet. So they collect this to feed to their young and the queens, queen bees collect pollen and eat it when they want to develop their ovaries to lay eggs. The nectar is the sugary source, the energy part of their diet. And for other, other insect species, they need plants, they eat the foliage. They need plants to lay their eggs on. So we have nesting sites, overwintering sites and larval habitats that may be associated with plants, and they may not. Some pollinating insects nest in holes in the ground, like the solitary bee nesting in a sandy bank. Some nest in the bee hotels in your garden. Some nest in dead wood. Things like pollinators, things like hoverflies, might lay their eggs and their larvae develop in a puddle or a pond or a ditch. They also need overwintering sites, so somewhere where they can take shelter in the winter, somewhere that's safe and warm and dry, somewhere where they won't get washed out, where they won't get too cold, and where they won't get disturbed. So many bumblebees, for example, will dig into the leaf litter, especially on the north facing side of a north facing bank, to be protected from the sun coming out and disturbing them. The pollinators need food through the season. So we mentioned earlier that the oak tree is wind pollinated and doesn't provide much in the way of pollen and nectar that pollinators can use. But there are lots of trees that do, particularly in the spring. The things like the willow that flowers really early produce pollen that, that pollinators can use. Things like hawthorn and blackthorn and rowan Trees and shrubs like these are really important to provide pollen and nectar early in the season. Moving on to the summer, there's a wide range of flowers that provide food for pollinators in the summer. Legumes from the pea family, things like clover that the long-tongued bumblebees use, or composites like the daisy and the yarrow that we've already mentioned. Dumbelifers like carrot, cow parsley and hogweed would also provide that out open flower and big platform that a range of pollinators can use. And the carrot actually has its own mining bee as well. There is a carrot mining bee. So in the autumn, we see things like thistle and yarrow and scabious that, provide, that, that, that flower later into the year, providing early autumn food. Ivy is often a very important source of food in the autumn. Here you can see it with the wasp on it. Things like rose and bramble that have a long flowering season are also important. And garden plants can also provide an extension to that season. Things like mahonia or pulmonaria early in the spring are fabulous. So moving on to the people side of the triangle. How can people help? How can you get involved? Well, you can volunteer, as Tammy mentioned earlier. You can support your local wildlife trust or some of the projects you can run in. You could support a national charity, a charity like Bug Life. You can give a donation. You can volunteer and help with their projects. You can help with the green recovery. 
You can record plants, you can record pollinators, you can record using the iRecord scheme, so you, which is an, an app that you can have on your phone or a website where you can take photos of what you see and record them on the system. Or you can do a simple pollinator monitoring scheme, flower insect timed count. And I'll give you a link to all the details for that later. It's very easy. You go outside and you find a patch of plants that you can identify and you spend 10 minutes looking at those plants in a 50 centimeter quadrat. And you record all the insects that visit those flowers. There are all the details on the pollinator monitoring scheme website. And you can benefit from being outside. There are health and well-being benefits of out being outside. And you can enjoy yourself. You can go outside for a walk. You can be active. You can notice the small things around you. You can share your wildlife experiences with others. And you can learn something new. You can learn about plants that you see and learn to identify them. So I'm just going to uh, talk to you a little bit about my experience with uh, plants and pollinators. So I did a, a degree in applied ecology and conservation at the University of Reading. And I was quite disappointed in the number of botany or entomology modules that were available. And every module that had the slightest section of botany or entomology, I attended. When I moved on to do my research, I worked on the tree bumblebee, Gombus hypnorum, the bee shown on the left. I spent many happy hours collecting bumblebee queens. This particular picture on the right hand side is me in Wisley, the RH, the Rafa Royal Horticultural Society garden at Wisley. Right, they gave me permission to collect bumblebees there. And domesticated heather is a really good plant to collect bumblebees from. I then went on to work at the University of Leeds on the pollinator monitoring scheme and support the short-haired bumblebee reintroduction project with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. I volunteered with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. I, bum I volunteered with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust when I moved to Yorkshire. And I, I complete fit counts. I complete the UK pollinator monitoring scheme fit counts as often as I can between January and September when the weather is warm and dry and submit those records to the scheme. I also volunteer for the POM scheme for their other uh, survey, which is a one kilometer square survey. And if you're really interested in monitoring pollinators, you can find more information about that in their website. And I'm also going to add that like Tammy, I was actually at the University of Lund in Sweden on the Shorthead Bumblebee project. And I was taken into their archive. I was able to hold a specimen of an insect that was collected by Carl von Linne, Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy. And one, similarly, I was absolutely thrilled. So just to finish up, I'd just like to give you a few useful links that might be helpful. So the top one is about Bug Life's No Insect Extinction Campaign and details what you can do to help reverse the decline of insects. We have our No Insect Extinction Manifesto there too. The next link is to the Bee Lines website where you'll find the Bee Lines animation. You'll find the Bee Lines map where you can record your project. And as Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust have been contributing to our insect superhighway, I'd be delighted if you could add your personal projects too. 
And as pollinator officer at Bug Life, I feel compelled to promote the pollinator guidance that we have on our website. There's a great deal of information there and it's very varied. It ranges from things that you can do in your garden to help pollinators to a GIS layer if you want to do some mapping, which is fairly technical and I must admit I leave that to others. And the final web link that I've included is the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology Pollinator Monitoring website. This is where you can find all the details if you'd like to do a pollinator monitoring pick out. So I'll just say thank you very much for your time. It's been a real delight to talk to you this evening and I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>